presentation today will be on using technology to build a safer future for workers. For 20 years, as the nation's leading wellness-based pain management and injury prevention company, Dorn has been keeping people out of the healthcare and workers' compensation systems through its on-site therapy, education, ergonomics, and technology solutions. Working with Intel, Alcon, Sealy Mattress, the University of California, and many other businesses and municipalities, Dorn has reached over 100,000 employees and saved employers more than 100 million in workers' comp and healthcare costs with a 600% annual ROI as validated by third parties. Kevin leads the strategy development and expansion plans for the company and oversees Dorn's focus on developing innovative solutions for pain mitigation with an emphasis on reducing organization's future costs with evidence-based results-oriented programs. Kevin is a widely recognized thought leader with substantial experience in strategic planning, negotiating, structuring, and conducting effective due diligence examinations for operational excellence in support of organizational scale, development of strategic partnerships, and client expansion. Having worked as a CEO and a senior executive for many large organizations, along with his significant experience in the healthcare space, Kevin's unique perspective illuminates the critical intersections between talent, assets, and ideas, the dynamic formula that drives business performance. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate uh, the introduction and uh, welcome everybody. And on behalf of Dorn overall, I want to thank everybody for participating today. Hopefully, we have a some information to share and, and can help people to start looking at different ways they can utilize technology to in, in ensure the safety of their organization and their people. So with uh, no further ado, I'd like to Get, get right into it. You know, I'm not going to read the agenda, but what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about where the state of injuries are in 2020, um, and we'll layer in some issues related to the pandemic. Uh, we'll talk about the cost of musculoskeletal type issues or ergonomic issues, as well as pain and, and aging in the workforce. I want to introduce the concept connected industrial work or connected industrial workforce, and what that means in the, in the scope of technology. We'll talk about seven different types of technology, both high-tech and low-tech. And then we'll talk about next steps for you to take, take this and bring it back to your organization. So let's get started. So when we start thinking about what's going on in 2020, there, it, it's really carrying forward from what we saw in 2019, 2018, and so forth. What you can see is that nearly 50% of the injuries are driven from overexertion, slips and falls, getting struck by an object. All of those are very preventable. And in fact, this type of injury, these injuries are costing people over a billion dollars a week and it's impacting the economy. And, and a little bit later, I'm gonna show you the cost of pain and muscular skeletal issues in the workforce and you're gonna be, uh, the, the numbers are pretty staggering. So we want to definitely uh, delve into that, but then what can we do about it? Uh, the National Safety Council says that every second, seven seconds, there's somebody injured. That's on somewhere around 540 injuries per hour, or over 99 million lost work days a year. That's a very impactful and staggering number. So that's where we are today. It, it, uh, when you look at the data from OSHA, yes, injuries are going down. People are doing a great job. And in fact, during the pandemic, we've also seen where in a lot of cases, clients have said, hey, we're just not seeing the injuries we were seeing before the pandemic. And that can be caused by a couple of things. Number one, it can be caused by the fact that people are still scared to go to a doctor. So they're not going to raise their hand and say, hey, I've got an issue. I want to go see the doctor. Two, with over 40 million people that were laid off, many of them called back. Uh, nobody wants to raise their hand to be, be the person that's laid off next. I mean, we just had, I think, last week another 840,000 people file for first-time claims. And lastly, I think people are being more diligent. They're more aware of their surroundings. The issue, though, is there may be some pent-up issues that are going on that once things start settling, we could get back to those rates that we saw before. So let's talk about pain and discomfort and muscular skeletal issues. Again, you can see the chart here, and what you can see is the total direct cost to the healthcare system is somewhere around $635 billion a year. You layer, that's for people going to the chiropractor. It may be Ahmed, it may be non-Ahmed. 
It's the cost that people are having in the healthcare system. When you think about presenteeism, which is 10x of what absenteeism, I'm going to work, but I'm just not feeling today. My shoulder's sore. Every day I go to work, my shoulder's sore. So there's going to be presenteeism in there. And that's about 57 days a year. And that's 10 times the cost of absenteeism. Then you start layering in on taking pain medications, either over the counter or prescription. Or I got some pills from a friend. That's an issue of about $78 billion that's costing uh, for productivity, lost time, and so forth. Then you just get the, I have a claim, back pain, I'm filing a claim, I go out on unemployment. The direct cost is $20 billion a year. With the indirect cost, it's about $60 billion. And then fatigue. And fatigue is something new that within the last few years, organizations are starting to look at. The impact of fatigue is significant. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But you can see it's about $136 billion a year in health and related costs. It's pretty significant. If you take all of these, and obviously all presenteeism isn't uh, muscular skeletal or pain related, things of that nature. But if you take all of these things, you're talking over a trillion dollars a year, the cost of discomfort, chronic pain, and so forth. And I want to clarify for everybody, when I use the word chronic pain, that means pain that I've had for over 12 weeks in a row, that back pain, that shoulder pain, whatever it is, for over 12 weeks in a row. And there are 100 million people men, women, and children that live, work, and play in the United States for over, that have chronic pain. That's one-third of the U.S. population, a little bit under a third of the U.S. population. In addition to that, the aging workforce. And you might say, okay, the millennials now outnumber the baby boomers. What does that mean? Well, the baby boomers still aren't retiring at a rate that um, starts moving the needle. So uh, over 55 accounts for about 25% of the workforce used to be 20% just three, four years ago. So we think there's a perfect storm out there where all these things are coming together to potentially impact this. So what can we do about it? Because technology can help in this. When you start thinking about a tenured workforce, people who maybe don't have the strength and conditioning they once did, what can we do about it? We call it the connected industrial work or connected industrial workforce. It's the potential, unleashing that potential of technology into the safety world. So the surveys show that 72% of manufacturing tests are still going to be done by humans. We read all the time about robots and cobots and things like that, and it's great, it's sexy, it's all that good stuff. But at the end of the day, humans are still integral to the nature of work. And so we have to figure out how to um, connect workers with technology in a fashion that makes them productive, makes them more healthy, more safe. And so let's look at how that works. Let's talk about, like I said, I think seven different types of technology. The first is artificial intelligence. Um, Accenture data says that 35% increase in order, worker productivity due to things like uh, AI technologies. AI technologies can look at things. They gather a lot of data, they back it up with algorithms, and they look at things like, is there a hazard? Is that worker, the way they're doing things, is that creating a potential hazard? Are they wearing their PPE? Are there slip, trip, and fall hazards nearby, be it uh, grease spots or other things? So AI technology, in fact, there's some ergonomic software out there where you can layer in AI technology that shows the movement of the body. Now, it doesn't correct it, but it gives you the diagnostic so that your interventions on corrections on body mechanics, additional training, additional tooling, whatever it might be, but the AI technology is already being used. In fact, in the construction industry, it's gone up uh, over one year about 240%. Something as simplistic as a drone is utilized for AI technology. But there's some huge potential there. It's just being scratched the surface. So it's something that people still need to do their research on, understand it better, how does it play, and, and not get caught up in the, in the excitement of something new, the next shiny object. It's there, it's usable, you have to understand how you're going to use it. Let's talk about exoskeletons. They're, they're suits, um, sometimes they look a little bit funny. Uh, and you know, you can see the, the woman has uh, the exoskeleton on her. Uh, but what it's doing, it's either augmenting or helping the strength of the person. 
Um, when people have to reach overhead for a prolonged period of time or if they have to lift, echoskeletons can help relieve that pressure on your extremities to not put as much strain on the body as might naturally be done when you're not using an echoskeleton. So let's look at a case study. Uh, a client of ours uh, manufactures airplanes in Wichita. And they were having significant issues with musculoskeletal issues and things of that nature. When people are working on an airplane, building an airplane, these are private jets, so they're smaller than not the Boeings. They're laying on their back, reaching overhead, because they're laying underneath the engine, or they're under the fuselage, and they're doing welding, they're doing fabrication. They're, they're laying on their back, and their arms are stretched very high to get to the work. This, is creating, this was creating a significant stretch. So uh, stress on the body, on the limbs, on the back. So the client decided to pilot an exoskeleton, got a couple of suits, trained the people up, and what they found was over a few months, they started to see a reduction in those either call off from absenteeism or just complaints, maybe not even injuries, but the, the issues related to, to muscular skeletal issues by using this echoskeleton and relieving that stress on the extremities, on the limbs, that were caused by being underneath that engine for a prolonged period of time, three, four hours at a time. When they layered that in with biomechanics training and mobility um, conditioning programs, shed MSD-type issues significantly. And also it increased the, the employee morale. In fact, when they got another echoskeleton, everybody was lining up, I want it, I want it, I want it. And that's what's really cool about some of these technologies. There's a hesitancy in the beginning. Is it going to replace me? What's it going to do? This looks funny. It feels funny to wear this suit. But after a while, what ends up happening, all these things that we're going to talk about today, they start building momentum on their own, and they start building that up. Let's talk about wearables. Anything from Fitbits that measure pulse and heart rates and things of that nature, it's a uh, wearable technology. The other wearable technology type that we look at is the actual uh, sensor embedded suits. So when you're doing an ergonomic assessment and you're looking at the work and how the work is done, these uh, sensor embedded suits are feeding back a lot of data to somebody who's analyzing that data around the job. And what it, you can do with that, to do a simple example, when an er ergonomist goes out there and does an ergonomic study, they look at it and say, okay, shoulder's the issue. We have to redesign the workstation or Kevin, who's all of five foot four, and somebody else, the first and second shifts, five foot ten. We have to create, you know, a parts table that moves up and down to help alleviate that shoulder issue. Well, what the wearables do is they get very deep. They show you the hot spots. They get and you can see very small circle in the, the lower picture that shows the various hot spots it pinpoints where that hotspot is so that when you create your interventions, you're, you're identifying those interventions based on the people who are doing the jobs as well as uh, where in the shoulder it is and how much stress is going on the shoulder. So these wearable technologies give you a lot of data to analyze and support. A lot of times what we do with clients, we will take 16 people over four departments do the analysis with the wearables, get the data, understand what it's telling us, because then when you do four people in each department, you're getting height differences, weight differences, you know, reach differences, those type of things. And then we create the interventions. And then we come back six months later and retest everybody with the suits. Now, it may not eliminate the hotspots overall with those interventions, but they're not as intense as they once were. So whether it's a Fitbit or the sensor embedded suit, there's a lot of different technologies. There's technologies where you're wearing suits and it tells you if somebody's fallen, a lone worker, uh, utility workers can tell if they fall. So there's a lot of information in these type of wearables that can really give you a, a lot of data to help design the interventions. Most of these technologies will not eliminate the MSD except for something like an echoskeleton. A lot of them will give you information that allows you to make decisions. Not everything's high tech, not everything is cool. Um, you know, we, we look at things like live virtual mobility and conditioning training. Uh, at first, I want to say, you, know, you, know, you know, understand if I don't use the word stretching, we don't believe in stretch and flex programs because they have very limited 
sustainability beyond the first few uh, minutes of, of a shift. What we look at is conditioning, and it's focused around conditioning the body for what it has to do during that day, whether it's lunging, squatting, lifting, whatever it happens to be. So in the era of COVID or in the era where people are remote, where you can't get to them, you could have organizations that create based on your work, not some generic off-the-shelf uh, training, either uh, recorded videos or in a case like we do, we do some live virtual training where we're actually teaching small groups, three, four people, social distancing, how to, how to pr properly condition their body, and then what are those micro breaks of mobility to, to allow them that during the course of the day, if I am underneath that aircraft, I can get up every hour and for two minutes do my mobility that allows me to continue being limber and so forth. So live sessions like this can be very helpful. Recorded sessions like this can be very helpful. But again, if you're going to do something like this, make sure it's aligned with the work you do and it's not a canned program because canned programs do uh, have potential. They do have uh, some potential for engagement, but you're losing that real engagement with people if it's not live. And two, if it's not geared towards your organization, then you're also potentially, people say, oh, that doesn't relate to us. We don't do that. So why am I even watching this? Live virtual self-care, major, major thing. Now, again, with COVID, um, I'll tell you, we had a significant amount of clients ask us, because we do a lot of on-site work, to stand down during the first few months of COVID, uh, knock down wood, all of them are back. But really, at the end of the day, they still had issues. And what they did is they said, you know, what, what can you do for us? Live virtual self-care. Not the same as being in person, not the same as doing the deep tissue work that we do and other organizations do, but what it does is it really helps people to take control of their own self-care. It allows them to do self-massage, self-sustainability, uh, you do a little bit of workstation setup, and you're teaching people. You know, we, we have a tagline that says empowerment through engagement and education. You're giving them the tools to empower them to take control. And when you look at the data where a majority of the people, I think uh, historically it's about 11 percent were remote workers are working from home. Uh, it's now around 60 percent uh, from non-manufacturing people, of course. And, and even next year, it's, it's projected to be somewhere around 34 to 40 percent. You still have people. And I can tell you, we went from never doing this type of work to we're now well over 40, 50 hours a week in virtual self-care sessions that we're doing this live, we're doing three, four, or five sessions per person, depending on their issues, and we're giving them the tools to take care of themselves. The other piece of it is live virtual ergonomic evaluations, especially for office people. And now there's some technology out there that you can do industrial ergonomic tools where you can train people to do the simplistic ergonomic evaluation, and then an ergonomist back home, whether it's your organization, or somebody else's, can look at the data, can make the recommendations, and with cameras uh, viable, uh, you can do this on smartphones, you can do it on tablets, you're getting the data. But for office, I can go live with our ergonomist who's out of Boston, and she can look at my setup. Do I have one monitor, two monitors, three monitors? How does that look? How do I sit? How do I position myself? Because when people are working from home, remember, it went from 11% to 60%, might be 35 to 40% next year. When people are working from home, they don't have that same support structure that they had on site. So you have to give them some tools, and one is the live ergonomic assessments that come with recommendations. Another is a desktop ergonomic software that we utilize. It's a self-assessment, self-correction tool. So I answer a bunch of survey questions. What's my body style? How many monitors? All those things we were just talking about. And it comes back with a risk profile. And it comes back with corrective actions on my part. So again, these type of tools are out there. They've been out there. The adoption is starting to increase significantly because again, that 35 to 40 percent next year that's going to be, it's still going to be working from home. Fatigue management. I mentioned earlier that fatigue is still an issue. Um, you know, the, the, the National Health Interview Survey said that people who get less than five hours of sleep a night are three times more often likely to have an injury. 
and the National Fleet Foundation says that injuries in, um, risk increases 70% with sleep deprivation. This is an issue. It's an issue for drivers, for forklift drivers, uh, for people who work on equipment that if they do something wrong, they're either cutting off their limbs or they're hurting their, their colleague uh, next door to them. Fatigue has become they're very academic about two, three years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's now becoming a little bit more mainstream where organizations are understanding the impact of fatigue. If you remember from that other thing, we had $136 billion worth of risk related to fatigue. And so these are things that organizations are looking at. Uh, it, there's software that's gamified. It identifies when people are fatigued, are not fatigued, they're cognitively impaired. And then it, it actually starts uh, no, no, giving notice to, to supervisors that somebody's gotten on. And then you figure out, okay, what's going on? Maybe they were just up late last night watching the ball game. Maybe they're impaired and they shouldn't be driving a truck. So here's a uh, case study, a uh, metal processing plant here in Colorado had issues with injuries almost every week. Uh, they instituted this fatigue de detection system. They even use it in replacement of drug testing because it, all they wanted to know is understand are people cognitively impaired. It's a fit for duty type of testing. It's gamified. And you can see the results. I don't have to read the results to you, but you can see the results that they were able to reduce impacts significantly just over the course of two years with this type of program. So I've, I've given you a lot of information in a very short period of time, seven different types of technology, high tech to low tech, and how do they work, a couple of case studies. So what do you have to do? I think, you know, as any investment, whether it's uh, into a new market, whether it's a new piece of equipment, whatever it might be, you really have to identify what are your goals, what are your objectives for injury prevention? As you're all in your budget season now, what are we trying to accomplish? Is it, is it more than just 10% reduction in uh, injuries? Is it a zero goal? Is it a, a zero injury rate? Is it humans above uh, anything else? What are those objectives? And then understand what your current costs are of doing business. What's the impact of presenteeism? Because you might think, we don't have a lot of injuries, but you have issues. Those musculoskeletal issues, they're sitting in your healthcare costs if they're not sitting in your uh, worker comp costs. Because for every dollar of worker comp muscular skeletal, there's five to seven dollars sitting in your healthcare costs. We have a client that had three million dollars a year in MSD worker comp, twenty-two million dollars a year in their healthcare costs. So what do you? What are those costs? Then evaluate your your user environment. How adept are your people in adopting technology? What's the culture? Are they going to accept it? Are they going to think it's cool? Are you know what's the how are you going to communicate it? You have to understand that. Then understand what data you already have and what data you want. And then when you start looking at user-friendly tech and vendor support, find a vendor that understands what's, you know, that they have experience with this. They're not tied to one solution. They can evaluate multiple solutions for you, and it's not driving you to one outside vendor uh, solution. If you bring in a consultant that can help you with that process, you're going to get the best of all solutions to choose from and then bring it all together. Start with a pilot program, look at the data, expand it, bring in other pieces. But remember, all of this technology does nothing more than augment your other safety initiatives because human beings are still part of this process. They have to be part of the process. And so what you're doing is you're empowering them, you're giving them tools, you give them hand tools, you give them forklifts, you give them other equipment. These are just tools to make them successful and that's what our job as safety professionals are and your job as ergonomists are, is to give them the tools to be as successful as possible. So really now's the time to start thinking about creating a connected industrial workforce. It can be done, it's being done, it's here, it's no longer on the preferences or in the horizon, it's on your doorstep. How you choose to, um, how you choose to actually implement it, there's many different ways to get there. And, and get the advice you need to help you get there. A lot of information. I want to thank everybody. Uh, I think we have some time for questions, Rachel. Yes, we do. Thank you very much for the for that presentation, Kevin. Uh, great information. I think the uh, the idea of that fatigue playing into injuries is something that a lot of us professionally have known for a long time. So to see that really have data-driven results for you is, is very interesting. 
Um, we do have a couple of questions. One, right. you talked about uh, the different types of technology, and yeah. if I read this question right, I think what we're asking is what, how would you evaluate if that is going to be a good technology fit for you? Sure. Is there a, a process you could speak to about that? Yeah, I think, again, first is uh, choosing a, a good partner that can help you along the way. A partner that understands, let's say you're looking at three or four different types of things that your ergonomists or your safety directors have researched and said, you know, we really should look at this. So think about it. Have somebody who is at, more expert at technology that, again, isn't tied to one third-party vendor to bring that one only technology to because everything gets geared towards that, right? We all, you know, we've all seen that. But then start thinking about, okay, understand that, that culture. How is this going to play with our organization? Do interviews. Get, the, get employees involved in it. You know, create small work teams that actually can help evaluate the various technologies. And then, honestly, if you get to the point where, okay, we just got to start doing something, do a pilot program. You know, a lot of these technologies are not that expensive that you can do pilot programs, and you just got to be careful that the organization doesn't perceive it as the flavor of the month. Oh, we tried this, it didn't work, now we're going to try that. Lay it out, communicate with people, over-communicate that, hey, we're going to be looking at a couple things over the next six to eight months, and we're going to define what works for you, the employees. And then you could bring in those two or three pilots that might be two or three different types of technologies with subgroups that try them, and then they'll come back and give you the feedback as to where they are. And so I think if you do it right with the communication and engagement level, it won't look like, okay, they tried one, it didn't work, they tried another, it didn't work, but try two or three and, and do it in a way that's pilot-driven. You get the data, you analyze the data, but if you don't include the people on the front line that you're going to be asking to participate in this, in those discussions, it will be perceived as something that, well, management really doesn't know what they're doing. They're just trying anything. Hope that helps. No, oh, great answer. Thank you. Um, a question I think along those same lines uh, in evaluation of any partners. Would you would you say that that mm -hmm. would also be the same the same type of answer there? Yeah, it is. But I think um, you know, it, it, it make sure the partner has some experience with the technology. You know, we represent. We don't create a lot of it, the high tech technology. We don't create a lot of it. Uh, but we are uh, user groups that we help define the needs of those technologies on the low-tech stuff, the live virtual stuff, that's all us. But, you know, again, make sure your partner has some exposure and experience with all of these that they can help evaluate the organizational goals. And it's not a jump to, well, tell me your issue because I think I have a technology for you. It's really what are you trying to accomplish? Interviewing some of the employees, watching the work streams, looking at it, and let – organization, be it us or be it others, there's many out there that could do this type of work, let them come back to you and say, here's what we think the process is. Here's what we think the go forward plan is. It's more of a consultative project and then say, okay, and if an uh, organization is large enough, they got the resources to evaluate the technology themselves. If they don't, they partner with folks like us and say, okay, we got it. We know what we want to do. These are the two we want to try. Let's do a pilot. Then you're there a lot with them along the way. And get, get your third-party vendor to have ownership in that process because long-term, if it fails, great. I got a consulting gig out of it, but I don't have a relationship anymore. So you got to have ownership in it from a partner standpoint. Great. Thank 